Thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program, Selling New Technology to DoD. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They're recorded and campaign downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 350 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So if you have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last side of the presentation today. A little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach almost 19,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. And now to introduce our speaker, Tim Brummelkamp. Welcome, Tim. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, Colton. Uh, and thank you also to Jennifer Schaus for allowing me to present today. Um, it's really an exciting opportunity. Um, hello, everybody out there. My name is Tim Brummelkamp, and I'm the president at Brummelkamp Government Relations. And uh, we're going to start first with a little bit of, of an overview of my company. Next slide, Colton. Let's go to the uh, company overview slide next. Okay, so uh, just a quick overview of my company here. Um, I'm a defense-focused business development consulting firm uh, since 2009. And basically what we do is we connect the innovations of our clients to U.S. government and defense industry customers. And we work with both complete systems, for example, an unmanned aircraft uh, uh, vehicle or, um, and components, which would be something like uh, uh, a lightweight armor or a, a heat exchanger for an engine, something like that. So we work on both complete systems and components. And what we do is uh, we identify the customers in the military who have a need for your technology. We, uh, we prepare a 90 second elevator pitch so we can catch their attention and get them hooked. Once they're interested, we set up meetings. Uh, we help the client put together PowerPoint briefings and other, and other uh, messaging. And then finally, when we meet with the customer, we seek out contract opportunities, uh, you know, business opportunities for our client. And we can also help to find funding within the government that your customer who's in the government might not even know about it. It's really about connecting all the dots for success to grow your business. Um, we also manage proposals and provide uh, general strategic advice on how to approach the government. Next slide. So just uh, my resume and a couple of lines here. Um, I was a congressional staffer, a military legislative assistant on Capitol Hill for seven years. I was a senior congressional advisor to uh, Army leaders at Army headquarters for five years. I helped uh, clients get defense appropriations from Congress for three years at a small lobbying firm. And I've been running my uh, business development consulting firm since 2009, uh, over 26 years of experience. Next slide. So today we're going to talk about how to sell new technology to the Department of Defense. And that's really an important word, the word new. Uh, if you're if your technology is a commodity and there's lots of competition that does it, it's really not going, this, this briefing really doesn't apply to those technologies. We're really interested in new innovations that we can bring in and get the attention of the Department of Defense. A second point I wanna make here is that this is really not rocket science. Basic, it's just like all other sales. What we wanna do is we wanna find the customer and convince them to buy your stuff. I know that sounds easy, but you know the the, the problem is in the details, how to find that customer and uh, and that type of thing. So today we're going to talk about how to sell new technology to the Department of Defense, and and I wanted to make the point too that we're talking here about all technology. I know right now the word technology and the word tech. Uh, most people think that's only information technology, and there are a million information technology customers seeking business with the Department of Defense. But we don't want to um, forget or leave out all the other types of technology that are interesting to the Department of Defense. 
So um, I'm, I'm very interested in information technology, but that's a subset of all technology. And uh, I think it's interesting, too, to take a quick look at the definition of technology from Collins Dictionary. You know, we're, we're talking about methods, systems, and devices that are the result of scientific knowledge and can be used for practical purposes. And, you know, basically what the Department of Defense program managers want to know is, how are you going to solve my problem? Uh, that's what we want to go in there with. And, uh, whether, you know, whether you have a, uh, a piece of software or a, some kind of smartphone app or a secure website or an aircraft engine or uh, uh, an aircraft carrier, you know, they just want to know, how are you going to solve my problem and uh, what can you do for me? So we have to always keep that in mind. We're going to help that military customer solve their problem. Um, in the military R&D world, and, and I worked in there for three years uh, under the Army's chief scientist, they use the word technology for anything, uh, including fabrics for a combat boot or an engine for a hypersonic missile. They'll all say that's technology. So that's, I just wanted to define up front what we're talking about technology. And in my business, I'm really agnostic to your type of technology, and, a, and I apply my same approach to all things. Um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter to me what your technology is. It's the same approach. It's just different customers. Next slide. So today our goal is to explain exactly how I approach selling new technology to the Department of Defense. I'm not going to hold back any secret sauce. I'm just going to tell you exactly what I do with all of my clients. And you can follow this process, too, uh, to find your customers at your business. This is your roadmap to success. Next slide. So when I talk to potential clients and they, they ask me about how to find business in the Department of Defense, I always tell them that there's two approaches. There's the passive approach and the proactive approach. So the, what is the passive approach? The passive approach is watching for government solicitations to pop up online. And you know, for many years, we've uh, watched on, on FedBizOps or FBO.gov, and I see that they recently transitioned over to the SAM.gov website for posting contract opportunities. But you know that's a passive approach. You're sitting at your computer at your desk every day and um, doing searches on SAM.gov and, and looking for new contract opportunities that match your technology. You must always do this. This is a requirement. It's not something you want to skip for the for the second approach. Always do this. Um, always be monitoring what the government's uh, soliciting for and and try to put in proposals for those uh, opportunities. Next slide. So this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis with my clients. Um, they, they spend their time, you know, uh, doing, looking at SAM.gov and keeping track of that. But when they want to take the proactive approach, I help them with this. And uh, what, what we do is we want to go in the back door to meet with the military program managers who have a need for your technology. We want to educate and inform them about your offering. And then we, we really want to stimulate some kind of test or demonstration of your technology. It's just like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. If they see it, they will come. And uh, we want to create a buzz in the Department of Defense about your technology. Those program managers, they all talk to each other. If you start demonstrating stuff, uh, it's probably going to pay off. We also want to influence their drafting of future solicitations. And uh, we'll talk about that again in a minute, but we want to put, we want the government program managers to put buzzwords in their solicitations about your technology, about your unique attributes. So then you can have a competitive edge when those solicitations come out. Um, they can't ask for something that they don't think exists or could exist. And uh, I've got a slide coming up in a second, but. The, uh, the government guys, they're really good guys, and they're smart, and they keep up to speed on technology as best they can. But really, uh, they don't know what the cutting-edge technology is out there right now. And so um, it's important for us to get in there and show them the cutting-edge technology so they can ask for it. 
Um, another important point to consider is that this backdoor approach, it goes against the grain of the government's normal procedures. Their normal procedure is to identify requirements for technology from the operational people in the military and then put out solicitations for technologies that will you know, fill those needs. And it's not normal for them to meet with the industry as part of that process, but it happens all the time. They do meet with industry a lot. And uh, that's why you have to get in there and talk to them and let them know about your technology. But a uh, meeting with industry is normally probably the last thing on the government program manager's list of things to do for the day. Uh, it's a pretty low priority for, for him. They're always very busy, and it's, it's often hard to get meetings with them. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of what I was talking about before, is that the government is normally a little bit behind on the technology curve because uh, industry is at the cutting edge. And sometimes industry has to push new technology to get the government to notice it, number one, and number two, to want it and accept it. Sometimes the government can even be averse to new technologies for various reasons. And I could probably give about a 10 hour briefing on technologies that took a lot of work to get the government to accept um, because industry's on the cutting edge. But this is, this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, everyone knows what the predator is because we've been watching it in the news for the last 20 years. But uh, in the early 1990s, the Air Force was completely opposed to using unmanned aircraft operationally. In a, in a war zone. Uh, they had used drones a lot for target practice, but they thought, the leaders in the Air Force thought that a manned aircraft, that was the way to go for all operational uh, missions. And there was a lot of opposition. There was a small contractor called General Atomics and they invented the Predator basically in their garage. Uh, they enlisted the help of uh, some of their members of Congress, got some funding from Congress, and. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the Air Force eventually accepted the Predator and it was ended up being the, the tool of choice of the president. And, you know, that was a, that was the way that the technology was introduced and accepted, even in a, an adverse con condition where the Air Force didn't want it. So next slide. So the proactive approach, how do we do that? It takes a lot of legwork to do the proactive approach, but it, the payoff can be great. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to conduct research to identify all of your potential customers and key players who might be interested in your technology. And we're gonna talk more about the details of that in a couple of slides. Um, the next thing you have to do is you have to draft a concise technical briefing on your technology that's in government speak, um, just the facts, and don't include any marketing fluff. Uh, the best way to write a briefing for the government is to pretend like you're a government employee. And I always tell my clients, I said, the more boring your briefing is, the better it is because it'll be better received by the government guys because it looks like a government briefing. I know that doesn't make sense in the business world, but that's the truth. Is, uh, if they hear um, marketing fluff, uh, it just makes them throw up a little bit. They don't want that. They don't want a sales pitch. They just want you to, to explain your technology and what its benefits are and how it works and how it will help solve their problem. So once we've uh, identified our customers and we've uh, drafted our boring briefing, we go on a roadshow to educate and inform those customers we've identified. And we try to create a buzz about your technology. Um, one of the reasons of going on the roadshow is to uh, educate the government folks and maybe also uh, defense industry people who might be your customers, get them talking about your technology because they all talk to each other and, and uh, create a buzz about this new innovation that they need. And uh, the other reason we go on the roadshow too is for a little bit, it's a little bit of a selfish reason, but it's to 
collect business intelligence. You know, if you're meeting with these people, you're going to hear straight from them what their concerns and needs and problems are. And you're going to hear uh, names of other players in the government. You might get referrals. And you're going to gather business intelligence on the roadshow. Um, the next thing is uh, when we're going on the roadshow and meeting with all these people is you want to identify one champion who is fired up about your technology and who can lead the charge from the inside. You know, maybe there's a government program manager who will uh, uh, help to influence the drafting of a solicitation in your, in your technology's favor. Maybe he will stimulate a small business innovative research grant solicitation that you can reply to. Um, maybe he has the power to uh, coordinate a sole source procurement contract for your technology. But there's probably, if your technology is good and, and they're going to want it, you're going to eventually find a champion who's fired up and who wants to work with you and partner with you to make your technology successful. One way to make, one way to find a champion is to show them how it can uh, help them solve their problem. You know, if, if they can help save the Army a uh, billion dollars a year in fuel costs, they're going to be a champion in their office, and they're going to want your technology so they can be the champion. Um, next is, uh, uh, we talked about this a little bit, pay attention to opportunities when you're going on your roadshow and meeting with all of these different players. Uh, you want to identify opportunities along the way that you can follow up on. Um, if they mention that they might be interested in uh, doing a SBIR grant with your company, you're going to want to follow up on that one. Um, the other thing is uh, just be uh, straight up with these customers in the government and say, hey, we want to partner with you. Let's find a way to partner so we can demonstrate this technology. And, and some of the solutions to partnering can be really low cost and, uh, and very doable. But be proactive and, and tell them, say, look, we, we see you have a problem. We think we can solve it with our technology. Let's do a demonstration together or let's do a, some kind of test. Let's partner. Be proactive. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this diagram shows examples of key players who you could engage in your roadshow. Um, in the center, uh, the center of the universe there, the yellow, uh, the yellow oval, that's a government program office and, or military program office. That's really what I mean is military program office. Um, they're all part of the government. But in, in, the, in the military, there's really two types of entities. There's program offices that manage stuff that military personnel use in the field. Uh, we call them war fighters, okay? If they're war fighters out in the field and they're on a ship or they're in a Humvee or in a tank or in an airplane, or in a command center with a bunch of computers. I mean, they're, those are warfighters using stuff, and the program offices, they manage all of that stuff for the warfighters. So that's kind of one group of uh, potential customers. The other group is what I call the enterprise system. Okay, so all of the government offices that are just managing, all of the military offices, they're just managing the military, you know, at the Pentagon and at the various different uh, uh, facilities around the country. They're, those are enterprise uh, offices, and um, those can be approached too. They're actually uh, very similar from place to place. For example, uh, you know, every military enterprise office is going to have a chief in information officer, and if you know, if you have an IT product, that's the person who you want to talk with. So, um, but today mainly, I'm talking about the program offices and in uh, technologies to help support the warfighters in the field. Um, so we've got the big defense integrators, that's like uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, or other prime contractors. Uh, there's the military operational unit, and by that I mean the actual soldiers out in the field or the sailors, they're out there and they're fighting the war and they have uh, a need. I don't spend a lot of time meeting or talking to military operational units, but the, the way that they can be valuable is they can generate a, a demand for your technology. Uh, they can actually draft a piece of paper, it's a form, it's called an operational need statement or an urgent need statement. If, uh, 
if they can generate an urgent they need statement for your technology, that can really uh, be a great benefit to you because they send that into the government's program office, the military program office that manages that technology. And then that program office goes out and starts looking for that technology and hopefully they'll find you or you're already meeting with them and they already know about you. So that's why the military operational units are very important because they can generate a demand for your product. And what it takes for you then, if you want to do that, is to find those military units out in the field, show them your technology, demonstrate it to them, and get them to, to want it. And, and then you say, hey, now I need you to submit an urgent need statement. Um, up in the upper right, we have the government R&D office. That's like the uh, Army Research Lab or the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, the, the military services operate dozens of research laboratories, and they feed into the program office. They're doing a lot of technology development on their own, and they also um, uh, partner with industry on research projects. And even if you think your product is a commercial off-the-shelf product, from the government standpoint, they might want to take it and do some testing uh, in the field or whatever. And, and see that it really works, they would consider that R&D. And so it's, it pays to meet with the R&D offices. Um, not only for that reason, but they're also um, very closely linked to the program office. So you might not know your program manager in the program office, but the government R&D guys do, and if you can meet with them, they can link you up to that person. Then finally, there are, there are actually internal government funding sources that your government program office might not even know about. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in, the, in a second. Um, but there are ways to get funding in other parts of the government for your customer who might not have any funding. So let's just keep that in mind. But this kind of just gives you a diagram of uh, the different types of players you're going to want to take your roadshow road show to. Next slide, please. So how do we find all these customers and key players? Well, uh, this just takes a lot of legwork and a lot of research time. Unfortunately, the government intentionally doesn't list contact information for most people online. Um, a big reason is security. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of bad people in the world who want to hurt uh, U.S. military workers. So uh, because of security, it's often hard to find um, the names of people. And also, uh, if they put their names out there, they get bombarded with lots of uh, calls from vendors. So that's another reason. But there are ways to find them. And, you know, what I do is I'll just go on to Google. I'll type in the name of your technology and I'll type in U.S. Army and then search. And I just want to see what articles pop up. And you'll, you'll probably find articles popping up of, uh, you know, the, Ar the Army's been doing work on some technology that's related to yours, and you're gonna see the name of a Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so who's the program manager, and you might find an industry name, some, someone from Lockheed or Northrop Grumman or General Atomics, and, and you'll find the names. Their, their contact info won't be in the article, but now you've got, you gotta to move to step two, where you take that person's name and you start typing it in and trying to find their contact info. Um, a lot of times I'll find a conference attendee list posted online, and you can find that person in, in those types of lists. But uh, it's, it, a lot of times Google can be very helpful finding these people. You just have to be a little bit uh, sneaky with how you do your searches and, and, uh, and find these people. Um, Sometimes, too, most of the time, if you're calling uh, the big defense integrators, you can call the main line and just ask for the person, and they'll patch you through. They won't give you their phone number, but um, if you have a name and you call the main line, uh, you know what location they work at, they'll typically patch you through to that person. So uh, these are ways to find the people. Um, also, uh, every military uh, installation has a public affairs phone number listed on their website. And if you call them and ask them for the name of a specific person working on that installation, they will normally either give you their phone number and contact information, or they'll patch you through to them or, or something like that. It pays to call the public affairs phone numbers. Also, um, take a look at the government solicitations that are listed on the, the SAM.gov website uh, mentioning technologies like yours, you're going to see clues to government offices, the names of government offices, and sometimes even um, 
uh, program managers, and, and that type of thing. So uh, the contracting officers are typically not important to us because they don't make any decisions about what technology to buy or not to buy. They're pretty much paper pushers and they just process contract documents. Uh, so don't pay too much attention to the contracting officers, but any, any uh, technical points of contact, that's a little clue that that's a program manager, um, things like that. Also, you can go to military websites and look at the uh, organization charts and uh, find the names of offices that are related to your technology. Then you can go and type in the name of that office and maybe find names of people who work there. Um, also, um, don't forget about your network. Uh, ask people in your network if they know somebody who works on your technology in the military. Or maybe ask, you know, ask more specific questions. Uh, which Army office handles uh, radio communications technology? You know, uh, do you know anybody who works there? Um, finally, uh, LinkedIn is very powerful, especially if you have uh, some of the more premium memberships. You can, uh, you can search for these people and find them. A lot of government people are on LinkedIn. Um, I've actually made some major connections in LinkedIn just with the cold message going into a, a colonel in the Army. You know, it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool and it's, it's worthwhile to use LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Next slide, please. So once you've met with your government customer, what are some ways to partner with them? Well, one of the easiest ways is to establish a cooperative research and development agreement. It's called a CRADA. And uh, this is an agreement, it's actually a legal agreement that they hash out in the government and they put all of your company in information in there and they describe what tests or demonstrations are, are going to be accomplished. And then you sign it as a company, it's a contract with the government. But the nice thing is, is it doesn't take any really government funding to fund the project. They don't have to go out and get other funding. They just have to apply some staff time to it. So um, your company would be required to uh, pay for your part of the uh, CRADA. You know, maybe you have to pr provide some uh, technology prototypes or materials or some, some staff to attend the testing. And then the government does the same thing. They'll have some staff assigned to the project and, and they'll do the research with you and they'll, they typically write up a report on the research. Um, it's a low cost way to get your technology demonstrated in the government. And hopefully if it's good technology that the government likes, they'll get addicted to it and they want to buy more. Um, the other thing that's really in, uh, helpful are these broad agency announcements. Um, you're probably familiar with specific solicitations that, are, that come out for something on SAM.gov, you know, on, on the government solicitation website. They'll come out and say, uh, you know, we need uh, uh, 200 copies of software that does such and such. You know, that's a specific solicitation. But most military agencies have these broad agency announcements where you can submit a, a, a proposal to the government that's unsolicited. And you want to meet with your program manager first, and he, he or she might say, wow, I'm interested in that technology. I would like to uh, do a demonstration of it, but I don't have any funding right now. And they might recommend that you submit your proposal under the broad agency announcement, and then uh, they'll keep their eyes peeled for it. And when they see it come in, they'll, they'll pick it, and it'll get reviewed, maybe approved, and then you can do a test with the government or, or whatever else the, they want to do. But the broad agency announcements are an opportunity. You just probably have to meet with your program manager first and kind of work that out. Um, another way that people get going with the government is you can stimulate a grant through the Small Business Innovative Research Program. And you know these are grants that go out to stimulate small research projects. And if you, if you ask the government, they would say that they always think these up on their own without any help from industry. And uh, they're always uh, totally objectively focused on their existing requirements, blah, blah, blah. Well, the truth of the matter is, about, I would say more than half of the SBIR grants are stimulated after meetings with industry. And uh, they, they have their, their mind on a specific technology that they want to um, develop and demonstrate and potentially deploy out to the field. Um, the nice thing about the Small Business Innovative Research Program is that uh, once you win the grant, 
after that point, it's a non-competitive process. So it's a three-phase process where the first phase, you submit a uh, concept, uh, just a paper. The second phase, they give you a bunch of funding, a few hundred thousand dollars to develop your idea. And then the third phase, if you make it to that phase, then they, you get funding to complete development for deployment to the field and procurement of your, of your technology. So it's a good program and it's a potential way to partner with the government. Um, also, uh, the big defense integrators spend a lot of internal R&D money on testing and demonstrations and that type of thing. So it pays to talk to them. They might want to uh, help you with your technology and uh, in introducing it to the government too. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the government also has internal grants where your government program manager can apply for a grant from another part of the government to get funding. And sometimes you have to hold their hands and point them to that opportunity to get them to do that. Next slide, please. Okay, good. So this is the same diagram we showed before, but this is in a real world example of something that I did with one of my clients. So. I had a client come to me and they had an aircraft engine that they had developed specifically for unmanned aerial vehicles. They didn't know anything about the U.S. government and they had no idea to approach the government, but they knew they wanted to sell it to the U.S. military. So I said, okay, well, let's, uh, let's uh, put your uh, boring government briefing together and we'll go on a road show. And so I took them on the road show. We met with a big defense integrator the Prime, who we knew was working on, uh, on unmanned aerial vehicles of the size that would take the engine. Uh, we also met with the Army's uh, program manager, UAS, that stands for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. And they were super interested in the engine because they had a need. The engine that they were using was going out of production and they were kind of up the creek without a paddle. They needed a replacement and they didn't have one. Um, then uh, we also went to meet with the Army Research Lab, their propulsion directorate that tests new engines for unmanned aerial vehicles. You see, you know, what we did is we just identified all the players who would be interested and we went and met with them. And we identified a need at the Army uh, Program Manager UAS. So uh, the roadshow was very successful. Everybody loved the engine and we waited a few months and we never got a call um, from the Army to order the engine. And I was like, well, what's going on? So I called them. I said, what's going on? And they said, well, they said, well, uh, we really love the engine, but we don't have any funding to pay for uh, uh, the integration of the engine into the aircraft. They said, we need research and development funding, and we don't have that. We only have operational operations and maintenance funding. It was a, it was a color of money problem. Well, then I remembered that um, there's this little office in the Pentagon called the Foreign Comparative Testing Office, and they provide internal government grants to test foreign technologies and compare them to incumbent technologies. And my, my client happened to be a foreign company, so uh, I called up the guy at the Foreign Comparative Test Office. He said, wow, that sounds like a great story. We want to learn more about that. So I set up a conference call where the Army and the Pentagon and the Army Research Lab, everybody was on the phone. And I just got them all talking about the same thing. The, uh, they needed an engine for the, the unmanned air, aerial vehicle. And uh, the Foreign Comparative Test Office had funding. So to make a long story short, the, uh, the program manager submitted a, a grant proposal to the Foreign Comparative Testing Office, and they got uh, adequate funding to buy two of my clients' engines for testing at the Army Research Lab. And, uh, and that's going very well, and it's, uh, it's, it's probably a top contender to replace that engine on the, uh, on the airframe that, that they need the new engine on. So this is just uh, an example, a case study of how we identified the players, and we went out and showed them the technology, got them interested in it. We found the funding, and we just connected all the dots to close the deal. So uh, selling new technology to the Department of Defense really involves a lot of legwork. Um, and you really have to uh, put in your time to introduce them to the new technology and, and get them interested in it. So that, that's the uh, completion of my uh, formal briefing, and I guess now we will go into uh, questions. Colton? Yes, so uh, we will now be answering questions that were submitted via email. 
a friendly reminder that we will not take any live questions today, so please contact Tim directly if you do have questions. We have about 17 questions today. Um, I sell a flash drive storage device, which was requested by current military to protect the USB drives they use. However, I'm not sure where to start. I'd like a recommendation since no NAICS codes are specific to my product and being uh, being a new product, very few in GDOD know about it. Tim? Okay, thanks. I really love this question because it tells me that this is brand new technology. It doesn't even have a NAICS code. And uh, this is the kind of stuff I eat for breakfast because it's exciting. I mean, uh, this is when we start the hunt for that for those customers who uh, want that product. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things I can tell right away from this question. Number one is it's new technology. Number two is you already, this, the person who answered this question already has a military customer. There, there's already somebody in the military who's interested in it. That tells me that there's other people in the military who probably want it too. And so uh, if I was this person, I would go back to my um, original military customer and say, hey, um, do you have any friends or other people who do your job that would like to see this, you know, and try to uh, work the network and find out. And if he doesn't have any friends or connections, maybe just ask him what type of government person or military person would like to see this. Just get the title of the people who want to see it. And then you have to start finding those people and talking to them. You know, uh, it may be the CIO of every military organization. Those are the people you might have to talk to because it sounds like an IT issue. Um, I'm not sure, but this looks like a very interesting hunting project. Uh, it's exciting stuff, and uh, if, it, if it really is new technology that they want, there's, there's probably a need there. Uh, next question. Is it easier to work with SI system integrators or go direct to DOD if you are selling IT products? Uh, this is a good question. I would say if your IT product is more of a commodity, if there's tons of competition using products like yours, then I would say go to the uh, integrators and try to partner with them on some of their giant IT contracts. Um, if it's a new, unique software, nobody's seen this stuff before, then I would go direct to the DOD and also the integrators. Um, but you, you want the DOD folks to see it and get interested in it, and you can maybe drive demand from the Department of Defense. You know, you want them to go back to the systems integrators and say, hey, we want software that does this. And, uh, you know, maybe you've already met by then with the systems and integrators and they're on board with you too. But if it's new technology, go to the DOD to show it to them so you can drive the demand for it. Um, okay, next. Question three, how are SBIRs, Small Business Innovation Research, and STTRs, Small Business Technology Transfer Research, used to buy new tech? Yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of uh, already talked about this a little bit, but the SBIR program and STTRs are really good programs to um, develop your technology for use in the military. And uh, the nice thing is when you win a, an SBIR grant, then the competition stops there. Uh, you don't have to worry about competition swooping in and, and taking your business. Um, the government will fund your concepts study, which is the paper study of what your technology is going to be. And then uh, if, you, if you win phase one, they'll give you money for phase two to, to develop the technology. And then phase three is to finalize the development and, and packaging for to field, to field it out into the field to the troops. And, uh, you know, eventually large volume procurement, right? So uh, those are really good programs. And, and the trick to those is to go and meet with a program manager first you know, and get them interested in your technology and then have them stimulate a new SBIR topic focused on your technology. So they don't know to ask for your new technology unless you go and meet with them. Kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Okay, next slide. How do we help shape the RFP request for proposal for the technology we are selling? Uh, I love this question too. This is a great question. The only way to help shape the RFP is to go and talk to the government guys who are drafting it. 
Um, you know, like I said at the very beginning, there's a passive approach and there's a proactive approach. If you want to just sit and wait for the solicitation to pop up on your computer screen, that's fine, but you know, you're not going to be able to influence the drafting of that. You need to identify the actual program managers, not the contracting officers. You want to identify the program managers who have the actual operational need for your technology and then go and meet with them. If they like your technology, they can put buzzwords in that focus in on your technology. But it's, it's really, you really have to meet those people. And here's another, here's another little tip. Um, many of the solicitations that come out from the military, the program managers already have the winners in mind in some cases, you know. So a lot of this stuff is wired in advance. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there writing proposals in the passive way. They're just sitting there. They see the proposal, the solicitation pop up. They send in the proposal and hope they win it. But those things might already be wired for other companies. Uh, uh, it's not always the case, but a lot of that is going on. And so you just have to be aware of that. And the, the best way to fight that is to go in and meet with the program managers yourself so you can be part of the process uh, on drafting that solicitation. And, you know, it's, it's not underhanded stuff at all. I mean, those, the government people, they want to know about new technologies, so they're making the best choices as they draft their solicitation. You know, it's just that the goal for you is to be part of the conversation and not, and, you know, not miss the conversation. Next, please. What is the best way to find and secure SMEs, subject matter experts? So by this, que in this question, I, I assume you're talking about government SMEs. Those are the ones you want to talk to that are interested in your technology. And we talked a little bit about this early. Um, one of the things that I do, probably the first thing I do, is I'll, tell you, I'll sit down, and if my client says they want to sell their technology to the Army, I'll, I'll sit down and I'll just Google the name of their technology or the type of their technology in U.S. Army and just see what articles pop up. And, you know, you might have to pour through uh, 30 or 40 different articles and websites on that topic, but you're eventually going to see the names of government program managers and maybe uh, managers from the big defense integrators. And, you know, you start to get three or four or five names and then you find their phone numbers and call them and you're going to start to put pieces together uh, who the SMEs are. It's really like solving a mystery, and you have to find clues and then follow the clues and leads to find your SMEs. Um, also, you know, remember to uh, ping your network and look at LinkedIn, and uh, those are some of the ways to find the SMEs. Next, please. Does COs, contracting officers, reject marketing letters, brochures, et cetera, from small business that aren't sent via Gmail? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, in my experience, contracting officers will never, ever reply to or care about marketing stuff that you send to them. I mean, uh, they're, they're basically non-players in my world. Uh, they're important people because they process all of the contracting uh, documents um, and make sure that uh, everything is, uh, you know, together when it comes to the contracting stuff. But the contracting officers are not your customers for the, you know, the customers are the program managers, the program managers who have problems that they need your technology to solve. And, you know, what, what they do is the program managers go to the contracting officers and they say, hey, we need this stuff. So then the contracting officers, they'll put out solicitations for the stuff. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're more bureaucratic paper pushers than anything else. They're, they're an important part of the process, and we can't live without them, but they don't make decisions about technology, and they won't answer questions about specific technologies or needs or that type of thing, and they really don't care about your brochures. So I hope that answers that question. Next, please. Hey. Can we stay on the slide for a quick second, if we can uh, stay on number six? If we can focus, I think uh, I'm going to just interpret that, and this is Je uh, Jennifer Schaus, that this question is maybe more focused on the fact that it's coming from a Gmail address and not a business uh, address. Um, I'll give you my two cents here, which is uh, if you can show that you're a serious contender by having a business website, by having a business email, 
um, there's not going to be one silver bullet. It's going to be a lot of little things that you'll do that'll make yourself uh, reputable and trustworthy and easy for the government uh, to work with you. And I think having a business email address is certainly going to help your cause. Uh, the contracting officer, obviously, as Tim mentioned, is not the, your right entry point or point of contact. Um, but if you're, you know, sending um, an email to the program manager from a Gmail address, uh, you're, you know, you're probably not going to get the the look that somebody with an email address that is a business address would get. And Tim, I'll give it back to you. Sorry for that. Oh no, no problem. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. I may have misread that question a little bit. Um, but thanks on that, Jennifer. Next, please. Question seven. What is the name or title of the decision makers within the DOD departments who are responsible for procurement of technology or software solutions such as Java? Yeah, so on this one, uh, I would just say one word, CIO. I mean, every military organization is going to have a chief information officer. And they're the ones who are responsible for procuring software for their uh, operation. And uh, I don't have a ton of experience in software solutions, but from what I know, um, these things are, are oftentimes uh, procured on, a, on an installation by installation basis or an organization by organization. So I think going to the CIOs is probably the right place to go to. Um, you know, I think this question, when I initially saw it, had a, a big list of different agencies, you know, maybe 10 or 20 of them wondering. And I would just say at every one of the, at every one of the agencies that was listed, you know, just going to the CIO's office is probably the best place to start. And, uh, you know, once you talk to somebody there, they would probably direct you to the person you really have to talk to uh, about software uh, procurement. Next slide, please. What is the best or most comprehensive URL, URL for obtaining information on contracts relating to software and information tech? Yeah, so um, if you're talking uh, contracts and, uh, and opportunities for software, the best place to go is uh, the uh, sam.gov website where they list all of the opportunities. And uh, it, was, it used to be fbo.gov, and I looked recently, and they've... Uh, they're switching it over to a new website, and it's uh, beta, B-E-T-A dot SAM dot gov. And on there, you can see contract opportunities. It's a searchable website where you can enter uh, your keywords and look for current opportunities for software contracts. Um, that's probably the best place to go. Um, and Jennifer, if you have any additions to that, I would appreciate that. Sure. Uh, I think exactly what you said, uh, the uh, Beta SAM, uh, FTDS, Federal Procurement Data System, and actually on the very last slide, uh, we have a list of um, all the websites that we're mentioning today. Um, I will mention on the previous question about Java, if you're selling any cloud uh, computing um, software platform uh, services to the government, uh, you probably want to go to the FedRAMP.gov um, site to make sure that to either get certified or uh, work through one of the uh, the resellers there to ensure that your software is uh, able to be sold via uh, FedRAMP. That's a good good uh, addition. Thanks, Jennifer. Next slide, please. For technology contractors such as software development or software providers, can you advise which agencies you would approach first on current DOD agency needs for COVID-19 or ranking of the top 10 agencies? Yeah, this is a good question and very timely. Um, you know, and, and Jennifer, if you have any additions, I would like to hear them. But if, if somebody came to me today and said, Tim, uh, take us to the best agencies for COVID-19, I would say, well, let's go to DHS and talk to FEMA. Um, let's go to Health and Human Services and talk to CDC, NIH, and CMS. CMS is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, I'd, I'd also say let's go talk to the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and then uh, the military health system. Uh, the Army, Air Force, and Navy all operate giant health care systems. And, uh, you know, they're not just focused on military personnel, but also military spouses and, and, and children, you know, families. So uh, the DOD health system is one of the biggest in the world. They've got hundreds and hundreds of facilities around the country and around the world. So that's probably the cream of the crop of places where I would go, and uh, unless Jennifer has any other additions. 
I think those sound great. Uh, I would also throw in as kind of a an underdog, perhaps Department of Agriculture, as they deal with uh, supply chain related to food, uh, U.S. farmers, uh, uh, meat packing, those sort of uh, industries from time to time, and, and commerce. And maybe you mentioned those. So. Um, yeah. That, that's pretty good. Uh, commerce and agriculture. I didn't think of that angle, but that's why two heads are better than one. That's right. um, next slide, Colton. Where can a small business who has never submitted a bid to a DOD agency find sample or templates of contracts, capabilities, and statements or paperwork necessary to submit a successful bid? Um, you know, uh, I can't think of a place where there's just a bunch of uh, examples uh, provided, but the um, SBA actually has a really good website. Uh, if you just go to Google and type in SBA, how to prepare government contract proposals, there's a whole lesson in there about how to do it and uh, providing tips and, and that type of thing. And with regard to templates, the uh, government normally when they put out a solicitation, they will attach templates for those documents that um, have templates that are required. So um, as far as your main proposal, like a technical proposal goes, a lot of times they'll simply say the only rules for that are you have to use 12 point font and one and one inch margins. The real, the, the, the main number one rule when writing proposals for the government is to uh, respond to all of their requirements, period. You have to respond to everything. If they say they want Time New, Times New Roman font, you need to do that because they will reject your proposal for being non-responsive if you don't use Times New Roman font or one inch margins, that type of thing. Um, it's really a checklist mentality. Uh, what I do when I manage a proposal for a client is the first thing I do is I sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and I make what I call a requirements matrix. You have to go through the government solicitation and highlight everything that they require, everything, even the one inch margins, and you have to put it in your matrix and make sure you check that off as you write your proposal. The other thing I like to do is I like to answer the government's questions in the order that they ask them. Uh, you really have to be kind of a stickler on these things because they can reject your proposal for the smallest thing. They actually like rejecting proposals because it reduces the number of proposals that their review committee has to read. So they are looking for ways that you're non-responsive. Um, I hope that helps. Next slide, please. If you were to use a third party or private consulting agency to assist in the contract submission process, which one would you recommend? Your top five? So I understand contract submission to mean proposal submission to the government. And if you need help managing the writing of your proposal, the best thing to do is just to ask in your network if uh, somebody knows somebody who can help you, just ask for recommendations. And uh, I just have to add that uh, both Jennifer Schaus and I do proposal management, so that's also an option. Next slide. Are IT products typically sold in conjunction with services for implementation? Jennifer? Thanks, Colton. Um, so I'm gonna answer this. Uh, it depends, and I'm not an attorney, but attorneys typically answer those questions with uh, it depends, or they answer many questions that way. Um, so if you're talking about um, uh, software or some sort of hardware, uh, if that does need some sort of implementation that requires someone that is a uh, professionally certified to implement that, then yes. Yeah. Um, if it's just kind of a, a plug and play, you know, a router that you're, you're plugging in, it doesn't really need to be programmed or anything, then um, those can just kind of be bought as uh, COT, C-O-T-S, commercial off the shelf. Um, so that's kind of why my answer says it depends. If you have something more specific, um, feel free to uh, reach out to either Tim or I after the webinar uh, via email or, or phone call to uh, get further clarification on that one. Are GSA schedules the preferred method of acquisition for selling tech to DOD? Again, it depends. Uh, GSA schedules are one of many, 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 many contract vehicles and uh, options that the government has when they purchase anything, whether it's products, services, or software. Um, GSA just does a great job of marketing themselves, 
And DOD is the number one spender, no surprise, um, through the GSA schedules. Uh, the reason I say no surprise is because DOD has the biggest budget out of all the other uh, departments. So um, depending upon your uh, technology, it's going to uh, depend on who your customer is and do they prefer to use the GSA schedule or some other uh, procurement vehicle. And uh, next question, please. What contract vehicles does DOD make available for selling technology? So uh, DOD, I don't know that I would say make available, but again, the government has many options for purchasing technology. They can uh, set the procurement aside for small business. It can be, you know, within that uh, subset, it could be hub zones or set aside. Um, there's all sorts of requirements that the government needs to follow when they make purchases, and those are dictated by the FAR, F-A-R, Federal Acquisition Regulation. So sometimes they may be using the GSA schedule. Sometimes they're using uh, their own agency-wide contract vehicles. You've got uh, uh, NASA SUP, S-E-W-P, which is a contract vehicle. You've got Navy Seaport E, which, again, is another contract vehicle. HHS has their own contract vehicle. OPM has their own contract vehicle. And the lists go on and on and on. Um, GSA can be used by multiple, uh, by basically anybody within the federal government. So you really want to be specific when you are um, selling a product or a service, whether it's the DOD or Department of Agriculture, and find out who is your customer, what is the preferred method that they use, and how are you going to find that information out. You can go, again, to FPDS, Federal Procurement Data System, to conduct your research there. And we can go to the next slide. Jennifer, of uh, contract... oh, sorry, Sam. Well, I just wanted to add to that question, Jennifer. Um, if you're a small company and you've never had a government contract, you, you might not have to have a prime contract to sell your technology to the government. A lot of times the government will use their prime contractors and you, as a, as a pass-through, and you can sell your stuff to the government through an existing prime contractor. You know, the government program manager might say, you know, to Lockheed, I want you to get this technology from this small company through your contract. So uh, it really, uh, you really have to talk to your government people sometimes to figure out what they prefer, what contract vehicle they want to use. Exactly. So the next question is, what percent of tech contracts have gone to small business versus large business in DOD? And they're in the land, the answer lies in FPDS, Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS.gov. You type in your NAICS code and all of the contracts all across government. You're going to have um, a pretty big Excel spreadsheet to sift through. And you can sort it by the agency that purchased those uh, products or services um, and look at the small versus large uh, business uh, breakdown there. Uh, if you've got subscriptions to any of the data aggregators, BGov, Govini, uh, GovTribe, uh, Deltec, or, or any of those, you could probably run a report within five or ten minutes. If you go to FPDS, it's going to take you a little bit longer, but you can still do it. Next question is, what are the main categories in terms of each in terms of tech needed by the DoD? So again, uh, you can conduct research on either FPDS. Uh, which I would recommend doing, again, federal procurement data system .gov. Uh, You can also look at procurement forecasts, which the government is required to post. We have all of the procurement forecasts for all of the departments listed on our website under the resources section. So you'd have to sift through that and look at, uh, if you're just looking for specifically DOD, then you would parse out the DOD uh, forecast and then parse out whatever they're buying in terms of technology or the same NAICS codes as, or product service codes, or anything that you can do to kind of narrow your search. Jennifer, if I could just add one thing there. Um, in recent years, some of the really high priority technology areas at DOD have been cybersecurity, uh, equipment for special operations forces, and unmanned systems like robots and unmanned area vehicles. Those are really hot areas. Great, thank you. Next question is, does DOD use OTAs or other transaction authorities used to purchase technology? So OTAs, uh, as Colton said, other transaction authorities, this is a mechanism that the government has another option uh, to purchase um, 
purchase it's either contracts and or grants uh, for technology and it's usually some sort of burgeoning technology now the list of uh, agencies and departments that can use it is uh, larger than you would think and there are some organizations within this list that I'm going to rattle off that have absolutely no restrictions so OTAs are outside of the FAR federal acquisition regulation these are kind of um, outside of the normal procurement rules they also do not uh, include the com Competition in Contracting Act, which is uh, makes it also uh, much more attractive. OTAs currently in this COVID contracting era are up. Uh, I believe I saw a number that was 400 percent. So these uh, these babies are on the rise. Uh, DoD obviously can use OTAs. Department of Energy, HHS, DHS, DOT, NIH, uh, FAA, TSA. Now the Organizations that have absolutely no restrictions are uh, NASA, uh, FAA, TSA, DNDO, which is a uh, domestic nuclear detection office uh, within DHS, and ARPA-E. So it's um, just like DARPA, but it's uh, Department of Energy's um, advanced research uh, group. So keep those in mind, especially if you do have something that's um, uh, an evolving technology that the government would uh, be able to use. And so these are just some of the websites that we mentioned today. Obviously, betasam.gov, GSA obviously handles all of that transition and all of the uh, the data and the technology that is moving everything uh, from fedbizops.gov and FPDS and everything else that's eventually all going to be residing on this uh, sam.gov site. Um, Tim mentioned today and talked uh, in great detail about SBIRs and STTRs. You've got a link there. We mentioned FPDS, USA Spending is another site where these are all public, you know, publicly available data. You can do your research. We've got the top 100 vendors by department. So if you're a small business looking to subcontract, as Tim mentioned on one of the slides here, you could be a subcontractor. We've got the list of who the top 100 vendors are within each uh, federal government department. And then the forecast uh, we have listed there as well. All free complimentary data for you. And Tim, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over to you and Colton. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Well, uh, that's about all I have for today. And uh, I just really appreciated the opportunity to speak to all of you. And uh, thanks again, Jennifer, for the opportunity. Thank you, Tim, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal contracting.